Hi there, it's Martin Twycross. I offer live monthly question and answer classes which I call mediumship clinics. To give you an understanding of how they work, this is a 70 minute sample from a recent class. I do hope you enjoy this sample. So I'm going to say welcome everyone to tonight's class and uh, tonight's mediumship clinic. Uh, so strangely this week we haven't had so many questions. So if you asked a few questions, the good news is you'll probably get them all answered this time. Uh, and for anyone who's not asked a question or is sitting listening to this and thinking I should have asked questions, please do ask them for the next one. So I've got plenty to go with for the next one. The good news is, is when you don't ask many questions, it means we get to spend slightly longer on the questions so we can work with the questions and give a bit more teaching with them. So without any further ado, I'm going to see if I can bring the questions up onto the screen uh, so you can see them all. Because otherwise I'll be talking about questions you can't read. So can I just check, can everybody see those questions? And can I see your answers? <laughs> More the point. Good. So let's get started with question number one. I'm all about meditation and sitting in the power. I've also noticed that the terms meditation and sitting in the power are commonly used interchangeably, and I know you say they are not the same. Can you explain the benefits of of the practice of traditional meditation versus sitting in the power meditation? And can you briefly explain how sitting in the power eventually aided your mediumship? So let's, so, so when we think about meditation, what meditation means to me will probably be very different from what it means to you. And there are so many different definitions of meditation from simply shut, sitting there with your eyes shut to doing all sorts of different mindfulness practices, relaxation practices, uh, guided visualization practices. So there are a huge amount of different meditations. And I explain it in quite a bit of detail in class two, uh, building power and sitting for spirits, if you want to go and have a look at that in a bit more detail. And um, if you like, there are components and, and meditations can comprise multiple components. And when people say to me, traditional meditation, it becomes problematic because in which tradition are we speaking? Are we speaking about the Buddhist tradition? Are we speaking about the Zen tradition? Are we speaking about uh, the theosophy tradition? Which tradition are we talking about? And meditations vary in different traditions even. At the moment, the most popular meditations, if you go and download an app for meditation, you'll find a lot of them are guided visualizations or mindfulness meditations. That is, if you like, where the fashion is. Um, whereas if you go into some of the more uh, religious, traditional meditations, uh, meditations used within the East, used within Buddhism, used within other traditions, a meditation that's designed to take you closer to God is actually a very beneficial meditation for your mediumship. That would work. But a meditation simply to relax you probably would have no effect whatsoever on your mediumship. A meditation where we're seeking to do a guided visualization generally would have limited impact upon your mediumship unless the purpose of it was designed to help you in some way. So with all meditations, a great deal of it depends upon its purpose and why it, how it's designed. And a great deal of it depends upon how well the person meditating adheres to the technique. And that, is, that applies equally to sitting in the power. So sitting for spirit, sitting in the past, sitting in the presence of spirit, call it what you will, they're all variations on a theme. They're all attunement meditations, they're all focus meditations. They're about uh, learning to attune to the spirit that is us, learning to blend with the spirit that is us, and then learning to blend, uh, to take the spirit of us and blend that with the spirit world. That's the purpose of sitting in the power. And... Sitting in the power, again, I describe this in great detail in class two. It has a multitude of benefits. If you actually think about what we need to do to become a medium, we need to quiet the mind, we need to enhance the awareness, we need to uh, hone our psychic faculties, all of those things sitting in the power will help you with. Different types of meditation may not, you see. That's where the problems lie. And I, I, I've done a great deal of classes, workshops, courses where people come to them say they say oh I'm, i meditate all the time i'm I, yeah, i'm a great meditator and then i'll get them to sit in the power and they can't do it and it's like well the meditation hasn't served you well because 
it hasn't quietened your energy. It hasn't quietened your monkey mind. It hasn't enabled you to sit in the silence. It hasn't enabled you to hold a focus within your mind. And a huge amount of meditation is discipline to be truthful. So the, the key with a lot of meditation is sticking with the program and is basically the discipline. So for me, some traditional meditations can help. Some traditional meditations may even take you quite a way forward. But the, the real meditation that's kind of designed for mediumship for me is sitting in the power. That is the tried and tested meditation that's been used for many, many decades. Um, and therefore, for me, it's the, it's the one I recommend. It's the one I was trained with. It's the one I go to. Uh, but I equally know other tutors of mediumship who do put a lot of store in certain traditional meditations where those meditations have a spiritual purpose, a spiritual uh, aim, where maybe that aim is to take us closer to God or closer to the spirit world or to, re to recognize our true spiritual nature. You know, some of the Eastern tradition meditations where you meditate upon a theme, say you meditate upon compassion, you meditate upon uh, the interconnectedness of all people, all of those as well can help develop spiritual qualities within us, which will help our mediumship. But I think just going for a walk in a wooded glade and listening to the birds and seeing the trees, that's much more limited. And just relaxing is even more limited. It's not going to do you a great deal of good. You know, I, I'm a hypnotherapist by training. I uh, used to do certain meditations to help people move into a state of relaxation. Those meditations are really, really, really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of mediumship. They, they serve really very little purpose for helping people to develop mediumship. So we must remember that all meditation must have a goal, a purpose, and aim. It must seek to do something. The person doing the meditation must strictly adhere to what we're asking them to do. If they don't adhere to what we're asking them to do and they just do their own thing, funnily enough, they don't develop. A lot of people I know say, well, I meditate a lot, but if I watch them meditating, they're not. They're just basically sitting in the silence and they're easily distracted. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea about what we mean by meditation and which ones may be beneficial. And one of the things I always say is what benefits you will probably be unique to you. So you've got to try a whole raft of different things to find out what works for you. One of the mistakes we make is saying that meditation worked for me, therefore it has to work for all of you too. And it doesn't always work that way. So you've got to experiment and see what works for you. So does that all make sense? And you'll have to type in the chat box because I can't see you. <laughs> cool. And uh, part two of the question, can you briefly explain how sitting in the power eventually aided your mediumship? Because um, for a long time in the early stages, I didn't really do, I was taught how to do sit in the power. I understood about it, but I didn't always do it as often as I should have done. And however, when I started sitting more regularly, there was a much more, a greater degree of consistency in my mediumship. And, you know, sitting for spirit is effectively attunement. Now I tend to, uh, you know, whenever you're working, you're attuning to spirit. But sitting in the power is a shortcut to speeding that process up. Some people I know have developed fabulous mediumship without ever meditating. So you don't have to meditate. It's not an essential. However, what I do know is that everybody that I know who has meditated has said that sitting for spirit, sitting in the power, has aided their meditation, sorry, aided their mediumship in some way. So it will enhance it. It will improve it. it. It should speed the process up. It should make things more consistent. It should uh, help unfold the abilities within. Again, if you go back to class one, unfoldment versus development. Development is basically teaching, developing someone to be a medium versus when we unfold our mediumship, we sit to create the right conditions to enable it to happen. We sit to create within ourselves the spiritual attributes that will make mediumship function better. So sitting in the power is a tool to unfold rather than a tool to develop from that perspective. If that doesn't make sense to you, you might need to go refresh your mind in class one. But does that all make sense to you?
Good, good. So I, I highly recommend it. Do it as often as you can. If you can't do it daily, which would be the ideal, aim to do it a lot of days a week. But even if you can only do it one day a week, it would be better than not doing it at all. That's for sure. And when I've seen other people um, with their mediumship, I've seen people who've suddenly started sitting halfway through their mediumship. And I've seen what I would call an absolute step change in their mediumship from being what I would call an average medium or even a not so good medium to they start sitting, they've been sitting for six months and the next see them and I go, wow, your mediumship hasn't half changed. What happened? And I started sitting for spirit regularly. And it's like they've become a fabulous medium or a very good medium. It's just made a huge leap in their mediumship. And that's what it can do for you if you've never done it before. But if you are doing it, then, uh, you know, you won't expect such a huge change from doing it regularly. But if you're not doing it at all, you've got nothing to lose. Nothing whatsoever. When you think about it, when we recognize the fact that we are spirit, when we learn to build our own power, we learn to grow our own spirit, and we learn to sit in the presence of spirit, that by itself will move us forward such a great deal, to recognize that we are spirit here and now, and to recognize when we blend with the spirit world that we are still, the energy that we're, we are, that we're taken to blend, it's the same energy. We're spirit here and now. That will help you a lot. So let me move to question two. When a medium sits for attunement before a demonstration or sitting, how is this different from meditation? You'll often see, you know, we'll often hear a medium ask for a little bit of peace and quiet before they demonstrate. Uh, just, can I just have a few minutes in that room by myself? Okay. And they go in there and they shut their eyes. They're on saying, oh, the medium's meditating. Or generally the song before the demonstration takes place. Um, you, everyone will be singing a hymn or a song and the medium halfway through the song will sit down, shut their eyes, make a link with, with the spirit world. And they're sitting on the platform with their eyes shut and everyone's thinking, oh, the medium's meditating. And in both instances, generally the medium is not meditating. We always recommend that you don't meditate before working because meditation moves you further away from the state you need to work in. Meditation quietens our energy and takes us into a passive state. When we work to do mediumship, we're seeking to get excited. We're seeking to become a more excited version of ourselves and make the link and go for it. So meditation will move you further away from that state. So if you like, we're becoming more of what I call a hyperactive version of ourself when we're doing mediumship, uh, a more energized version of ourself. But if I sit for spirit or if I sit and meditate, I just totally let go. I totally relax and I go deep. And then when I come back, you know, it takes me a little while to come back. And it's, if you said, go do mediumship now, it'd be, it'd be so much harder. Um, I have done a trans, a trans address on the platform as an experiment and then demonstrated mediumship after a song thereafter. So in the UK, in a service, you have your address, then you usually have a hymn or a song, and then you have the, the demonstration. So I've actually gone into trance and delivered the address in a trance state. Um, and then had one song to sort myself out before I then move into mediumship. Now the trance state is a lot like sitting in the power. It's a lot like meditating. And to move from that state into demonstrating was a heck of a challenge. One heck of a challenge. I found it really, really challenging. Um, and it took me a while before I'd say my energy was right for working and demonstrating. The first couple of links were like pulling teeth because it just wasn't good. And that's what would happen if you sat in the power directly before you meditated. It's not a good thing to do. So I'd always recommend that if, if you're doing a reading or a demonstration, you'd sit at least an hour beforehand. Try and leave, it, leave a good gap in between. However, attunement is different. So what is a medium doing when they're attuning to the spirit world? For me, generally, if I, I will have five minutes in the medium's room or five minutes in the office of a church to work. And what do I do? I set the intent with the spirit world. I'm working here tonight. I'm, if you like, it's almost like going through a prayer and blending and attuning with the spirit world and letting them know what my intentions are. My intentions are to bring through evidence of survival, to demonstrate to that audience 
to demonstrate beyond doubt, ideally, that their loved ones survive, to demonstrate the power and presence of the spirit, to, bring, to, to get each communicator to bring forward that evidence so that the communicators themselves know to bring the evidence to touch souls. And for me, it's, it's kind of a very much what I call a spiritual prayer, all done within attunement. So I attune to the spirit world, so I'm connected to spirit. And then I'm setting what I, my intents for I would like to take place that evening. But recognizing that the spirit world may have a greater need than me. I can set my intent that I'm an instrument of the spirit, that I'm there to touch souls, that I'm there to be the voice of those in the spirit world, to re reunite them with their loved ones in love. And I set all of that within my mind. So when I do a prayer, it's kind of like a much shorter version of that. Do you see what I'm saying? But it's, it's an active attunement. I don't relax and do nothing and go, oh, go nowhere. It's active process. It's active communication. And then the point, I don't do this to be truthful. I don't sit while, just during the song to get my first bits of evidence. I actually work in real time. I teach all my students to work in real time. So I think it kind of feels a little bit cheeky of me to then during the song, sit down and start collecting all my evidence because that's not what I'm asking other people to do. And plus I don't really like to see a medium do it myself. I like to see a medium when it's time to work, they just work. But sometimes when I'm singing the song, I'm aware of spirit drawn close and okay, someone's coming close and let me feel yeah, it's dad and, Oh, he's a comedian. He was hilarious. He was always doing practical jokes. Okay, what else about you? And okay, he, was, he had a job where he was very straight-laced and it's almost like a compensation. So I kind of get that in my mind while I'm singing the song and I know that's my first link. So when it's time for me to start working, I've done an introduction, I can then go straight in to the evidence of my first link. And I may even get a second link and then maybe someone else draws close and I'll say, well, okay, one of you can come first, one of you can come second, I'll work with you in a moment. We can get our first one or two statements of evidence from it. I sometimes do that, but you won't see me shut my eyes. I won't do it my shut, I'll just be singing the song and doing it normally, and just gently allow my mind to move, to allow my mind to blend with the spirit world. So that's what's taking place. So can you see why I say it's different from meditation? The medium is not meditating. It's a form of attunement, it's a form of connection to spirit. And often some mediums, even before the demonstration in, in the medium's room, will be getting evidence. I know some mediums who will actually get all their communicators and line them all up whilst they're sat there and then sort the order out they're working. I don't go as far as that. I like to try and leave a lot of room for spirit to work. But whatever works for you, whatever works for them, you know, I'm not here to knock any of that. At the end of the day, if it works, it's great. You're all with me so far. So let's move on. So we've got a whole raft of questions now all about platform work. So question three, when doing platform, how long should you take per reading? And by reading, I, I, I call it contact. When, when we talk about platform work, I never talk about readings. For me, readings is when I'm working with a person one-on-one. -on -one. We call them a private reading or a private sitting. So Generally in the UK, the terminology, we would, never, we would never use reading for platform work. That would be a contact, delivering a contact or a link to somebody. So uh, the questions are all phrased, I'm assuming in US or Canadian speak, but uh, I will translate them into English or European for anybody else who's listening. So how long should each contact take, each message, each link take per reading? And seven to 10 minutes is suggested. And if you listen to me talk in the class, I, in whichever class that is, probably uh, number five, structure of a contact, I probably say the same, seven to 10 minutes. What I'm going to tell you now is different. You know, if, if I'm getting people to work within a very strict boundary to begin with, yeah, I'll say, okay, aim for seven to 10 minutes per link. But once you get to a point where you want to place your own unique stamp upon your mediumship, then how long it is per contact per link will be dependent upon how your mediumship works. So some of the great mediums of old, they were so fabulous that 10 minutes, they could deliver a huge amount in 10 minutes, so they needed five minute links. However, if you're incredibly slow, you probably couldn't get much done in five minutes. You'd take maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And depends how long it takes for you to get your 
link placed to the right person. If, you, if, if it takes you 10 minutes to get your link placed, clearly the link will take longer than 10 minutes. So a lot of it, first of all, depends where you are with your mediumship. If you're at a level where you can generally get them placed reasonably quickly, then I'd expect them to not last as long. Uh, if you're going for an award, such as the PAS, Platform Accreditation Scheme, or the CSNU Award, which is a Certificate of the Spiritualist National Union, they expect platform mediums to deliver two links in 15 minutes. You're given a 15-minute window, and it depends on how nice your assessors are, but basically, they expect you to deliver your two links within 15. From what, what, from what I've seen myself in, uh, in watching assessments, generally they'll give you a minute either way, so 14 to 16, generally. So you're, you've pretty much got to deliver two links in 15 minutes. Now, if anybody here is thinking of doing an assessment or going for uh, an award with the union, uh, one technique of doing this is you must, you must note the time at which you start and you must note the time that you need to finish by. So if you started working at 7.39 and you've got 15 minutes, then you had 15, 7, 39, 8, 54. So you need to keep an eye on that clock at the end to make sure you finish pretty much on time. If you ignore the time you start, you're in trouble because then you've lost track of time. So keep an eye on time is key. But if it's not an assessment for an award, who is there to have a go at you about your timekeeping apart from the church or center chairperson? Not many people really. So you, then you need to decide what your intent is. Or is your intent to try and touch as many people in the audience as possible? And I have actually seen a medium give everyone two minutes of their time to hit 30 people in a demonstration with no real evidence at all, really, to be honest. Everyone gets, oh, you've got a mum here and she liked cooking and she's come here to give you a message of, you know, keep your pecker up, you know, stay positive, you'll be fine. And these little short links, I don't know, have any, has anyone here ever seen people work like that? Or is it just me who's seen that in the UK and other places? Ultra short links, messages that are mainly psychic, no real evidence of survival. I don't recommend it. It's pretty rare, actually, even in the UK. I, you wouldn't get away with that in our church, or most churches I work in wouldn't accept that at all. But sometimes you see it. You know, two minutes is way too short. I'd say five minutes is a pretty short link. So I'd like you to do more than five. But if you, know, if you go direct with every link and there's no mucking about placing it, then five minutes direct with somebody, you can get a lot across. So you know, maybe five to seven min minutes. If you're having to place it and having to work it a little bit more then maybe seven to 10 if you're... But equally, you know, the other thing is, the other thing to think about is we shouldn't put the spirit world on the clock. If that's their only opportunity in life to communicate with their loved one, sat in front of them, if it's the only time their loved one's ever gone to a spiritualist church or may ever go to a spiritualist church, how right does it feel to say, you've got seven minutes now and when it's seven minutes is up, I'm cutting you off. Hang on a minute. Does that feel right to you? Do you think we should put them on the clock? Do you think we should put them on a timer? Or do you think we should say, I'm here to deliver what you need me to deliver but hopefully you'll understand that there's going to be a lot of other communicators coming through. So you, you can't hog me for 40 minutes, but equally, if it takes 15 for that one link and that one link is vital, you know, if I'm bringing through someone's mum and I've had their mum 40 times before, Oh yeah, you got my mum. And they're not really that interested. You know, that's not why I call a critical link. But if I bring through someone and the, it's a person's first time in a church, they've never had a loved one through before, and it's really touching them emotionally. I'm not going to say to spirit, I'm sorry, mate, you're on the clock, seven minutes, eight minutes. No, I'll work it until it's done. And I may even work it for 15 minutes. Um, I'll work it till it's done, until I, until I feel I've done what I need to do for the spirit world. Or until they begin to step back and they're happy that we've delivered what they need. Um, but if you did that going for an assessment, you'd fail. You understand that bit like a driving test really on a driving test you've got all these strict instructions you have to follow once you've passed your driving test and you've got your license you've got a little bit more leeway about what you do so you know we for, for me my job 
is to serve spirit. My job is to be the mouthpiece of spirit. My job is to reconnect them with their loved ones. My job is to bring through messages of healing. And a lot of that, you can't really put a time on it. You know, sometimes I, I've done a demonstration where, you know, it's a 50 minute demonstration and I've done three or four links. And people might say, well, that's, that's, you should be doing way, way more than that. But at the end of the day, if those three or four links really touch people in the audience dramatically and the rest of the audience know categorically that that is amazing evidence and you do not die. Have I done my job as a medium? Whereas you might say, no, 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 as a medium, in 50 minutes, you should be touching seven, seven, 49, seven people at least, maybe more. Again, it depends what your intent and your aim is with your mediumship. If you want to get around as many people in the room as possible, keep it short. If you want to do the work for spirit, don't put them on a timer and let it work the way it needs to work. However, if I have seen a medium do a one hour demonstration where three links, only three, 20 minutes it took per message on average. And the audience was bored. It was like a private reading for each individual. Now, and again, I don't even think any of the links were what I would call a desperately needed link. If it's a desperately needed link, I'd take longer with it. If it's a profoundly healing link, I will give it more of my time. But if it's not, I don't, definitely 20 minutes, it would have to be pretty unique for me to go 20 minutes. But at the end of the day, I don't feel we should be putting spirit on the clock. Do you see what I'm saying? But remember that audience attention and expectation has to be taken into account. So if the audience expects you to keep doing pretty quickly, every other medium does, and you're doing 20 minutes, you're going to upset them. Um, so, you know, 10 minutes, if you aim for an average of eight to 10, but some will take longer, or an average of eight to, or eight to 10 is your goal, but if some take longer, so be it. That, that wouldn't be bad in my opinion. So hopefully that will make sense. So question five. No, I don't know if I skip one. I've skipped one. Yeah, question four. Let's do four before we do five. How much evidence is acceptable when reading a person during platform reading? So again, I would phrase this. How much evidence should you give during a contact on platform? How much evidence is needed? Now, for me, there has to be sufficient evidence for the recipient to recognize their loved one and to really know their loved one is there. That's what I'm looking for. Sufficient evidence to be recognized and sufficient evidence for the person who's receiving the contact to really know their loved one is there. So yeah, that sounds a lot like my mom. That's not the same as you've definitely got my mom. That is my mom. There's a difference. Now, some mediums I know would ask the person, have I given you enough evidence? However, some recipients may say, no, I want loads of evidence. Or I may have an incredibly high threshold for evidence. You know, I need a lot. So the only way you'd be giving them a lot is to do a private reading for them all night. And you can't do that on platform. It's just not going to happen. So you've got to make the judgment call on what's enough. And the way I teach as well is that we need to start with a good body of evidence. And when we give them sufficient evidence that it's clear they know who it is, we can, I then say, free the spirit to be with their loved one. Free them to share time, free them to communicate. But a lot of that communication will be equally evidential. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? So initially, I'm looking for evidence to get it recognized, to get it proved. But once the person says, they know who it is, yeah, yeah, that's it. I then say, okay, I'm now not asking you for evidence. You may now bring through a message but often what comes through within the message is extremely evidential as well. You know, they may bring through some shared memories. They may talk about things they've done together in the past. They may talk about objects of exchange. I've, I've given you this and I'm really pleased you're wearing it. I, you know, you've got my ring and I know you're wearing it tonight and I'm so grateful. It's evidence, but it's equally the message as well. It's, can you see what I'm saying? So the, when we free them up to, to communicate, we're not looking no longer for the evidence specifically. But often within that, you'll get the evidence interlaced with it. And the thing is, what is sufficient, how much is acceptable will depend upon you, yourself, and what you like, and what you think is good. Some mediums I know are happy to just 
give a few statements and if it's recognized, that's it. Give a message and move on and you can knock those readings out in three or four minutes. It's not what I do. You might, my, my understanding is the job of a medium is to bring through evidence of survival to demonstrate the reality of life after death. And I would want everyone in that room to recognize that I'm not with them. There's only one person can take what I'm saying. I'm not with them. I see a lot of mediums work and I saw one work last week and they go direct to people. And you'd know a lady in the spirit world who liked cooking. And then we get loads of generic stuff through about this lady that she liked to keep her hands clean. She preferred to have her tea from a cup rather than a mug. Uh, she didn't wear trousers. She mainly wore dresses. It's what I call generic evidence. It would fit anybody. And when I hear medium work like that, I listen with my mind and I think, okay, if this medium is working with me now, can I take every statement? If the answer is yes, there's no evidence there. Or there is generic evidence, but there's no specifics. So really what I would want when I'm listening to a medium work is that if I listen to all the, me the evidence coming through, none of it would fit me or my loved ones. It, none of it could fit anymore. You, you proved to me you were that person over there. And only that person over there can take it. So if you like, that's the standard I apply to my own mediumship because it's the standard I listen to other people's mediumship with. So I have to have enough evidence that I've got myself down to one person in the room. Nobody else can take it. And then I'd like some stuff in there that's pretty good that will, you know, if there's someone in the room listening who's there for the first time, I want them to understand the reality of mediumship. I want them to understand what mediumship's about. I want them to go away thinking, yeah, there's so much information there that it, they had to have been communicating with the mind of someone in the spirit world. It couldn't have just been reading them or guessing. It wasn't cold reading. It wasn't second guessing. It wasn't generics. It wasn't what we call Barnum statements, which sound specific, but they're not. P.T. Barnum said we've got something for everybody. And it, that's, what, that's why we call them Barnum statements. It sounds specific, but it actually fits everybody. But even though it, first impressions, you think, oh, that's quite specific, but it's not. So does that make sense to you? So how much is acceptable will really depend upon you. And some of that may also depend upon the venue you work in and their expectations and the audience expectations. It's all about managing expectations this work as well. Does that make sense? Are you with me so far? And the thing, the thing I'm trying to get across tonight as well is um, that sometimes we can be too rigid with our answers, you know, I could say to you, 70% of the link should be evidence. The last 20 to 30, you could focus upon the message. Whereas the reality is, provided the evidence is good, it could be a 40-60 split. It could be a 50-50 split. It could be an 80-20 split. It might be a 90-10 split. There's really, there's nothing hard and fast, but generically, we'd probably say three quarters a quarter, generically. But within that, there's all this room for moving. Now, Melanie, are you asking about the Barnum statement? Is that what you're asking about? In which case, a Barnum statement is spelt Barnum, B-A-R-N-U-M, after P.T. Barnum of circus fame. Okay, so let's move on to question five. How much time would you put towards an introduction when doing platform, and what would you say? And again, remember, there's not a one-size result here. So first of all, it would depend upon, A, where I'm working and how long I'm demonstrating for. If I'm on for half an hour, my introduction's got to be short. If I'm on for an hour and a quarter, my introduction can be longer. Does that make sense to you? Do you see that? So, you know, if I've only got 20 minutes, if I spend the first 10 minutes on the introduction, I'm only going to be able to do one link. If I've only got 20 minutes, if I do a shorter introduction, I can do two links. So again, we need to manage it to suit the venue, uh, the length of time we're working, what we're doing. But the point with an introduction is the introduction for me is about managing the expectations of my audience. And it's about getting the audience to help me. That's the whole purpose of the introduction. It's about making my life as a medium easier. So what do I want the audience to do? I want them to listen to what I'm saying. If they recognize the information I'm giving, I'd like them to talk to me, speak up, put their hand up, not be shy. Don't come to me at the end and say, I could take all of it. I'm just shy. It's my first time. No, if you recognize it, put your hand up and take it. 
I explain to them how I work. So sometimes I've got direction, but sometimes I haven't, which means you've all got to stay awake and listen and think about all those you know in the spirit world. And if the information fits one of them, speak to me. Uh, keep an open mind. I want them to keep an open mind. We always say, I'd always say as well, don't feed the medium. Don't tell me about your loved ones. Don't give me, give, give me information about them because it affects my own mind. I want a blank mind. I want you to allow me to give you the evidence. I don't want you saying, oh yeah, that's my nan and tell me your nan's life story. Tell me your grandmother's life story. It wouldn't help me. I'm, I'm the one who's talking. I really want them to answer up in short. Some people say answer up yes, no, don't know to me and that's it. But that's far too restrictive for me. I don't mind if they answer me up yes, no. I can sort of understand what you're saying, but it's not quite right. I don't mind if they answer me up, oh my God, that's fantastic. Wow. They're, they're all perfectly acceptable answers. By saying yes, no, don't know, it's just too restrictive, too narrowing. So, but, so I don't tell them, give, that, that's the answer you've got to give me. But what I would say is just don't feed me information about them. Um, I also explain to them a little bit about how mediumship functions. I don't go into clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairgustans, clairknowing, none of that. They don't need to know any of that. All they need to know is mediumship's a form of telepathy. It's mind-to-mind -mind communication. And all they need to know is that I'm not hearing spirit. Spirit are projecting their thoughts and I'm interpreting their thoughts. And I sometimes receive imagery. I receive feelings. But they need to understand that this is not a conversation. They're not talking my ear. Hello, my name's Bert. I'm here for whoever. It's, you know, people have often have an unrealistic expectation of that's what mediumship is. But if you explain to them it's telepathy, if you explain to them we receive information and there's some degree of interpretation required and we can interpret it wrong, then they're not going to be quite so tough with us if they, as if they think we're hearing everything in our minds and it's got to be 100% accurate. I'll often say the best mediums are only 90% accurate, 80% accurate. We can all get something wrong. So if I get something wrong, give me a little bit of leeway from it. I generally, that said, I generally don't tend to, to tell people that too much at the front, what I can and get wrong, because then if you start making excuses for your work before you've even started working, uh, their trust in you begins to drop. So if I start getting no's, I, I'll then explain that even the best mediums can get no's. Sometimes you may have to go check on it. Sometimes the best evidence is information you don't know within your mind. But equally, I can accept that I can be wrong. And let me go back into the evidence and let me see if I can convert that no to a yes for you. Let me see if I can just, if there's something I'm missing. Does that all make sense? You see what I'm saying? So they're the kinds of things I would cover. I would cover how I'm working, whether I'm throwing it out, whether I'm going direct. Uh, the other thing I always say as well in my demonstrations is that I never choose who gets a message. I don't look around the room and think who's nice and easy to work with. I don't look around the room and decide I want to work with you. I just open to spirit and I let spirit choose who's going to get a message tonight. So I say, I think you're all equally deserving a message. And all I do is I ask the spirit world, everyone who belongs to these lovely people here, anyone who wants to come work with me, please come work with me, but please come work with me one at a time, please. And that always gets a laugh and a bit of a giggle. And sometimes I'll say, I don't know how they work with me, whether they have a ballot, whether they've been camping out since seven o'clock this morning, whether they have a scrum and whoever can get the front first wins, I don't really mind how they work as long as they come one at a time. That's for spirit side to figure out. I just let them know, you know, my job is to bring one forward at a time for you to recognize it and to bring enough evidence that you know who it is. Then I'll let a message come from them as well. Then we'll finish it off and get the next one. That's true, Marie. But having said that, if once you get to a certain level of working with your work, um, what you don't want to be doing is to be seen to be given excuses early on. In the early stages, yes, I agree. You can say, I might not get all this right. I'm still learning. And it, it does give you a great way of lifting the pressure. Absolutely. When you get to being a very well-established medium, I don't really like to see mediums give a dozen excuses as to why this demonstration may not work. I always used to say myself that mediumship was experimental. And, uh, you know, it's the one thing that we can't rehearse. I can't rehearse this. If I was going on stage to do a show, I could rehearse it. If I was doing a stand-up act, I can rehearse it. Mediumship, it's all in the moment. Can't rehearse it at all. It's all experimental. 
Um, but again, when you start saying it's experimental, it kind of suggests it can go wrong. So you have to be a bit careful. You're with me. Good. So let me move on. So question six, should you include an intro? Can I come to you? And conclusion, thank you for allowing the spirit, allowing the spirit to share their love for each reading during the platform work, each contact on platform. Now, I, I don't ever do that, to be honest. I, I don't ever ask to anybody, can I, is it okay if I come to you? Unless I can tell from their body language that they're incredibly nervous about having a contact. But that said, um, if, if you're going direct, then yes. But what, what I would tend to do is in the introduction, say, yeah, and again, this depends upon the venue. If you're going to a spiritualist church where pretty much everybody there is happy to receive a reading, it's fine. You don't really need to ask the question. If someone's volunteering to take it, someone says, oh yeah, I know who that is. I think I can take that. By them volunteering to take it and putting their hand up for it, I, in my mind, they've accepted me coming to them because they've volunteered for it. If the person doesn't want to take it at all and is sitting on their hands and then I feel I'm with them, I feel it's there, then yeah, I might say, yeah, I'm really feeling drawn to you. Yeah, can I work with you? Would you understand this? And, if, and some people may say, I don't want a link. Some people might say, oh, I don't want a link. I'm just, I'm just, I'm the designated driver. I'm here tonight just to be with them. I've, I've come as a driver. I don't want a link. I find this scary. You've got to honor their wishes. You can say, well, you know, they've made the effort to come. Do you want to hear what they're going to say? No, if they don't want it, you actually have to honor their wishes, I'm afraid. You shouldn't force a link onto somebody. So, so then the second part is, so that, that's the first bit. I generally tend not to do an introduction with the rare exception of somebody, or if somebody's really being, you know, sometimes during the, the song, we might sing a hymn, and someone's in floods of tears, and you get a link for them then I would say, is it okay to work with you? Because from a sensitive point of view, really, I know you're emotionally upset at the moment. Or if I'm working with somebody and they start getting emotional during the message, I'll say, is it okay for me to continue with you? Are you okay for me to keep working with you? And again, it's just managing their, their emotion and their sensitivity. Uh, that's primarily what it is. So I very rarely ask I know some mediums who will say, and, uh, you know, I'm assuming all of you tonight are happy to receive a link. Or you put your hand up now if you don't want a link, and they'll see someone put their hand up. But I don't really like to do that. I just work with it as we go. If someone really doesn't want a link and you go to them, they'll let you know pretty quickly. I'm pretty sure of it. So then the other part we come to is, should we do a conclusion? Now, remember, I teach the CERT method, communication, evidence, reason for coming, tied up. The tie up part means you have to finish each link off so it's clear to the person you've finished it and then start a new one. I, I hate to watch mediums who just go from one to another and leave it hanging. Or we're still saying, oh, I'll come back to you and never do. That really, I really think that's unprofessional in the extreme. So links should be tied up. But what you say to tie each link up, again, you need to find what you're comfortable with, what works for you. There, there are a whole bunch of generic ones. But um, if you can make it evidential, it's better. You know, but there's all sorts you could do. The problem is, please take their love is a bit too, you know, not every person coming forward would necessarily be that kind of person given their love. Your next door neighbor who really you're not that close to, but has just shown up for whatever reason, you know, again, you don't want to be saying, oh, and they're bringing a huge amount of love for you, so take that love. Well, hang on a minute, that doesn't make sense. I didn't really know him that well. Or your work colleague who you weren't that close to, there's not going to be a huge amount of love. But if it's mum, and mum's got this huge amount of love pouring out of her for you, she's so proud of you, then yeah, you might say, and I'm going to leave you with, with spirit's love. You might say that, yes. Um, some people say at the end of a link, and thank you for working with me. Thank you for speaking up. If someone speaks up to take it and thank you for working with me, thank you for speaking up. Uh, some people say, uh, you know, so I have heard mediums say, and I'm sure you'll agree that the, your loved one was here. However, that's a very high risk strategy for what the one person in the audience says, well, I wasn't really sure to be honest, no. <laughs> and then they go, oh. So it's a, you know, a bit of a high risk strategy. You've got to be pretty, you know, 
you know, there's a whole stack of things you can say if they brought through some wonderful evidence, you know, and, uh, and let me leave you with that. And I think it's wonderful that your loved one's been able to bring through such great evidence this evening. So I'm going to leave you with that. You know, we can finish in a variety of ways. However, some, sometimes if I get, um, you know, I get a man who never took his hat off, even indoors, he's forever sitting with his hat on. All these people who sit indoors with his slippers and his hat on, uh, you know, is that side going out hat wears all the time? That's, that's really good evidence. Do you think? Think that's good evidence? Maybe you don't, I don't know. But anyway, if you, if you think it's good evidence, and I hope you do, I might save that till the end. I might think, well, rather than giving it now, we'll hold it to the end. However, the problem is at the end, if you then say, you know, the feeling I get with this man is he never took his hat off. You'd understand that. And he always wore it indoors. And if they say, well, not really, you spoil your ending. So you might need to bring it in earlier on. You have to decide with the specific evidence you get. But let's say for, for argument's sake, during the link, I mentioned that this man never took his hat off. Always sat with it on indoors. And sometimes he even might have slept in it. The finishing message might be me. He's raising his cat to He's taking his hat off for you. He's showing his love and his respect. He's taking his hat off. He's doffing his cap to you. Well done. You know, generally there'd be a message in there that it ties in with that. But, but can you see why that's an evidential ending? And uh, so I like, I like that. I like it if something, you know, or this man, I, I know this man, hang on, he loved drinking whiskey. Now at the end, he's raising a glass of whiskey to you and saying cheers. He's so pleased to be reconnecting tonight. Cheers. That's his message. And that's how it ended. Wouldn't need to say, take his love. That's it. Just, you know, and then, then we get our next message. And generally what a lot of us have been trained to do is when we finish giving our, our message, we then have that drink of water. And people say to me, why do you always drink water at the end of every link? Is it thirsty work? There's actually two reasons, really. Having the sip of water at the end buys you a little bit of time to start the next message. So let me just finish the message and take, and I'll say take their love just for the sake of it, and take their love. Now, I've actually walked to get my water, had a sip of it, put it back, walk back again. In that few seconds, I've been asking for my next link. I've got a lady here. He's drawn close to me. Yeah, what can what, 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 I get heart attack? He passed in his 60s. It's a very close family. So before I even open my mouth to talk, I've already started getting more information, more evidence while drinking. Can you see that? It buys us a bit of extra time. But also we use the act um, through the process of classical conditioning. Do you know Pavlov's dog? Pavlov's dog, whenever uh, you brought out the food, you brought out the bell, you ring the bell with the food, you associate the bell with the food. Whenever you ring the bell, the dog gets hungry because the dog has always associated and paired together bell and food. It's the same with having a glass of water whenever you finish a link. Having that sip of water, actually, if you like, ends your link. So it's a, it's a positive reinforcement of it. Um, some people halfway through the link, if they get stuck, they'll grab their water and have a sip. Hang on. And it just buys them a little bit of extra time. And again, it's it's... It's going to be their conditioning for, to go deeper. Um, and some people say to me, what, why does having a sip of water during a link make it better? What, how does it fix problems? And of course it doesn't. It's just that's what the person's trained themselves to do through time. Are you with me? <laughs> I hope you are anyway. So yes, you can do that. It's pretty common. Uh, you know, I, I know everybody who I know who's been trained in the local churches in the area where I live pretty much does that you know we all do but it's not it's not a bad thing to do certainly the glass of water between links um it does buy you that extra time but then again it can be a bit quiet so you can make a joke about it as well if you wish you know some people joke about mediumship being thirsty work some people joke about going to get their drop of gin all those sorts of jokes come out a lot i once was working in a center it was actually a village hall and there was a bar on, and I made a joke about my water being gin and tonic. Somebody with a good sense of humor went to the bar, actually did get a gin and tonic, but no ice and lemon, and actually swapped it 
my water for that and it looked almost identical. I picked it up to have a sip of water and it was gin and tonic and I got the shock of my life. And then I realized, hang on a minute, someone swapped this out. So I then said, well, okay, whoever put that there, if it was spirit, just make sure you put some ice and lemon in it and I'll have it at the end of the demonstration. But we don't want to mix my spirits while I'm working and so on and so forth. And, you know, it gets people laughing. So let's move on. I'm going slowly tonight, aren't I? <laughs> so we've done six. Number seven, feeling a pull or throwing it out or both, what method would you recommend for platform? And that one, there's a whole, whole video on this, uh, finding your recipient. So the thing is, at the end of the day, we have to find our direction. And not all mediums will have direction to begin with. So a great number of people start by throwing it out and that's all you can do. All you can do. You can try for direction, but if you're not right, you're going to throw it out. However, if you watch a medium work who throws it out, it's more exciting than watching a medium work who goes direct every time. Because I call it the eBay mentality. We all want to be able to have a bid on something. So they start working and they've got a lady. Oh, I know one, I know one like that. I can bid on this one. Oh, yes, yes, I'm getting excited. Oh, I can't take that bid. No, no, that next bit's not me. Oh, no, I'm out. You can't bid anymore. But it kind of keeps people's interest because we're all thinking of all the people we know, the bank of loved ones in the spirit world, the bank of people who we know who are spirit side, and we're all comparing and contrasting information. And it builds audience interaction and you get their power. Whereas if you just start every link, you finish here, and now I'm coming to you. Oh, I'm not getting anything tonight. Oh, it's no fun. And I actually find mediums who work direct for a whole demonstration lasting over an hour. It, it flattens the image in the room and it doesn't make life easy for them. So the best mediums will try and mix it up a little bit. Even if you could go direct for every link, if you're that good, you could go direct for every link. You may not do it. Or you may say, well, I feel I'm drawn to this area. And then just keep giving the evidence and then narrow it in direct, even though you're pretty sure who you know you're with. You're like, by, by taking it to an area, it's a halfway house. You've got everybody, you've got the area, you've got the individual. It's kind of just narrowing it down a bit. But if I talk about I'm coming towards the back, everyone at the back gets excited. They get the energy of everyone at the back because they all think, oh, I might get a message now. Or I'm coming to the left-hand side, everyone on that side then starts listening intently. Or I'm coming to a lady in the audience and I've got your father. Everyone who's got a father in the spirit world is thinking, oh, I hope this is for me. But if I just go, I'm coming to you, I've got your dad who's in the spirit world. Everyone else just goes, oh, it's not for me now. And what happens is a lot of them switch off and start thinking about what's on TV tonight. And, and you don't take them with you. Whereas if they're all forced to listen because you're throwing it out, then you're holding their interest and their attention. And they generally follow the link better and if you throw it out, if you go direct straight away and lose them, then they may not follow the link at all and you may have lost them for that link. Does that make sense? So there is, no, there is no one that is better than the other. If you can get some fabulous five pieces of evidence, that's amazing, and then go direct to somebody, that looks impressive. If I say I've got dad here, his name's Charlie, um, and I know dad had three heart attacks, he had bypass surgery, but the third heart attack took him. And I'm feeling drawn to you. Can you take all of this? Yes. So your dad's Charlie? Yes. Three heart attacks? Yes. Bypass surgery? Yes. Wow. Can you see how good that would be? So if you like, from the point of view of the skeptic, going direct with fabulous evidence that nobody else in the room could take would probably be preferential. But from the point of view of the working medium and holding everyone's energy and trying to keep as much audience interaction and involvement as possible gives you the most power to work in. So from that perspective, you might be better to throw every single link out to hold the power. Um, but even good mediums who are capable of going direct and every link will mix and match it. Some will throw out, some will go to an area, some will go direct, mix and match it to, to get the best, the best of each because of those pros and cons on each way of working. You want the pros for some, and, but not the cons, and then you want 
the pros are the other, but not the cons. You have to mix it backwards and forwards. Does that all make sense? But generally, I know very few people who can work properly and go direct to begin with. Very, very few. Mostly you have to be trained to do it. So you'll mostly start from throwing it out and then move more towards going direct and getting better and, and getting better with your direction. And even now my direction isn't hundred percent. I don't, I can't find every person direct. Um, sometimes it's 50%. Sometimes I know half the links exactly who they're with. Others I may feel drawn to the back, maybe the back two rows, somewhere in the back two rows. I kind of feel being pulled down the church back two rows. But others, I just have no idea. There's no sat nav there. We just work with it. And for me, I don't really think it matters, provided your evidence is good enough. Provided your evidence is good, provided you're bringing forward the presence of spirit, provided you're doing the job for the spirit world, whether or not you can go direct every time for me is immaterial. And I hope you'd agree. But there you go. That's just my opinion. Other tutors may say something different. And, you know, again, you've got to find the right way for you. So question eight, is it possible to give another contact to a recipient when doing platform? Well, absolutely it's possible. Absolutely. Can you get somebody else's, you've just given them a link, somebody else comes along and it's for them as well. The first link was their, hus was their, um, was their mother. The second link is their father, mother's husband. I often joke they've shared a taxi down. <laughs> I have done a demonstration where I've got five contacts for one person back to back. I wouldn't recommend that. It's not ideal. But in that occasion, the spirit world really wanted to touch that person. And uh, I'm sure most of you will have heard that before somewhere in the video, so I won't get the story. But sometimes we have to remember it's about what spirit want, not about what we want. We want it all to be one for everybody and lovely and fantastic. And the spirit world have got a different idea from the spirit perspective they know what they're doing from the spirit perspective they're trying to touch souls they may somebody may be there who really needs evidence but one contact wouldn't be enough so they'll bring through two or three even everybody else in the audience has already had all their evidence so the need is greater for one individual within the room can you see that if you work and say in a room of 10 people nine of them are old hands they've had multiple multiple contacts one of them is new tonight is a bit of a skeptic to really a spirit to really demonstrate to them they're present they may need to bring through one one more than one communicator you see so again we kind of have to we have to be flexible enough to follow the will of spirit rather than the will of what we desire or what we want we don't always know best that's important to recognize that should you give a second contact? It depends upon who you talk to. I have no problem doing it. Um, is there what, what etiquette is there to follow when given a second contact? Generally, I won't go overboard uh, with it. So if the first link lasted 10 minutes, the second link, I'll probably shorten it a little bit. Once I really know who it is, then we'll see if the message is the same or different. So it may only be five minutes or six minutes if the first one was 10. You know, it depends. It depends. So how long I spend will depend on what I'm feeling in the moment, feeling intuitively into what's taking place. Um, you know, I, I might even just keep it to three minutes. You know who this is? Great. And you know, so you know spirit is around you. I feel they're just reinforcing the message I've already given. So, you know, so yeah, take the love of spirit. Know that all your loved ones are gathering together. Know they've shared a taxi down. Know they're all here for you. And leave it, move on. And question nine is a bit is similar theme, but in more detail about a scenario. Question nine, I've been told that during an assessment for the PIS, Platform Accreditation Scheme, and CSNU awards, you would fail if you give two contacts to the same recipient. And that is true, generally. In general, from what I know of the assessments, I hold the CSNU award. I never did pass because pass came out after I'd already got my CSNU award. But it's kind of, it's the precursor. The same rules typically apply for both. Um, the rule is you do two links in 15 minutes and they should go to two separate people. That's the generally accepted rule. So would you fail if you give two contacts to the same person? Generally, yes. If it happens, one tutor advise that you should acknowledge that the person has already had a contact, then you should bring it to a close by giving their love. You then find another communicator for another recipient. What is your advice on this? 
Yeah, the generally accepted policy is in that scenario, you wouldn't give it. So as soon as it becomes clear, this person, you're recognizing this. Okay, well, in that case, uh, you've already had a contact this evening. Um, so recognize that your loved ones are around you. There's two of them here. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for working with me. Let me get another link. Go get another link. So it's pretty much the same advice here. You then look, finish it off quickly. Don't spend too much time. Let go of it. Get your next link because time is of the essence. You may have already burnt two minutes trying to find that person. And therefore, you've still got to fit another one in. If you go over a little bit, I think they might give you a little bit of leeway if you're working it well. Um, so that's question nine. Question 10. Would the entire time spent giving messages during platform be the same amount of time you spend with an individual reading? Well, it would depend upon how long a platform demonstration is. So different churches, centers, theaters have different length of times and want you to work. If you're doing a shared platform, you might only be up there for 20 minutes in two links. If you're doing uh, some churches have what I call like a shortened service. They do like a full length service and a short service. The full length service, the mediumship lasts for an hour. The short service, it lasts, lasts for 40 minutes. Some short services are only half an hour. Um, so it depends. If you're doing a theater demonstration, you might have, half hour, you might have a break in between, but you might do two 45 minute stints. You might do an hour and a half total. So it would depend upon the evening and it would, then it depends upon how long you do for private reading. Most people doing private readings, generally they're half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. That's pretty much the ballpark you're looking at. I know some people who offer short private readings, 20 minute readings, but really that's a very short reading. The very least you'd really want would be half an hour. My own readings, I advertise them at 45 minutes. If I go over, it's fine. It means if it isn't working out as well as I would like, I can park it up at 45. So for me, I kind of worked on a, what I call a 45 minute to one hour reading. So I would never book readings back to back at 45. I'd book them by the hour. And then if it does go slightly on it, I've still got a bit of leeway. I, again, I don't like to put spirit on the clock. I don't like that. So if a reading really needed to go on for longer than an hour, then if I could, I would. However, if, say, I'm working at the Arthur Finley College where readings are booked bang on the half an hour and everyone, you know, you, there's no scope for going over. You've got to finish on the half an hour. You've got to be disciplined with your timing. So certain times when we're doing readings, we have to have that discipline, that discipline. So this question, it really would depend upon the length of the reading and the length of time you work platform. Um, but say you do a 45 minute reading and a lot of churches, a lot of centers have pretty much an average 45 minutes to an hour of platform. So you could argue the two, the two are, are relatively comparable in that instance, but not always will they be the same. And do you need more power to do an hour sitting or more power to do the platform? And again, it will depend upon you where you're most comfortable working. Generally, you haven't got the power of an audience when you're doing a reading. So reading, some people find readings more challenging. When you've got on platform, you've got the energy of the audience giving you that, that power, makes it easier. But that said, I could do a whole morning of readings. I couldn't do a whole morning of platform work. So I think platform takes its toll upon the mediums more and burns the power more and limits us more. So platform, if you like, seems to burn into a greater rate of, knots burn the power whereas doing sittings you know i've done i have done a day of sittings before from about 10 in the morning to four in the afternoon with a break for lunch so say that's what, five hours of readings i couldn't do a five hour demonstration in an evening no chance even if i had a half hour break i still couldn't do two and a half hour, two two and a half hour slots it's just not going to happen so that's question 10 question 11 is there a way to get the signal from spirit more focused when there is more than one or a bunch of them all together? And again, the language is not what I would use because I don't treat it as a signal from spirit. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I just tune in 
and receive evidence. That's what I get. I don't really consider it a signal as such. It's just the flow of information from the spirit world. And the next part of the question, I will, all, I will ask spirit to go one at a time, but sometimes this doesn't always help. And occasionally you will get more than one spirit come forward, but it should be the occasion, not the norm. If you're getting quite a lot of spirits communi all coming together at once, something's going horribly wrong with your mediumship, I would suggest. Generally, um, again, if you're a beginner, it can happen more often. But if you're an experienced medium, then really getting more than one spirit coming forward at the same time when you don't recognize it's more than one, again, that should be the exception. You know, less than one in 20, I would think. You know, I, it very rarely happens to me. I do 50 Dems a year at least. And it's pretty, pretty much not even every year. So in a demonstration environment, it's pretty rare. Sittings can happen a little bit more often because in a sitting, several people will come forward for that individual, if that makes sense. So if you come and sit in front of me and you've got four loved ones in the spirit world, they might all want to come and connect to you. On a platform, we're kind of asking for one spirit to come one at a time. And there'll probably only be one of them come forward because they know the restrictions of platform. So therefore, uh, you know, it's not going to happen as often on platform because of, if you like, the unwritten rules were setting up. But in readings, it can do. So how do you make sense of the blended energy? Is there a way to unblend them other than just asking spirit to come one at a time? And is it a practice thing? Um, so how will you know if you've got more than one of them? The way I know, I, I often don't feel it. I'm working. And then someone says to me, well, I can take that bit with somebody. I can take that with somebody else. And then I go, hang on a minute, is there two here? That's so I'd start thinking. And then I bring through another bit. And this is with this one. And I bring through another bit. No, that's with the other one. All right. So then I'm going to have to accept that you, none of it fits one person. No, but these bits of evidence fit this one. Yes. And these bits of evidence fit that one. So how am I going to sort this out? So in my mind, mind I'll say, okay. So you've just, the ladies, I know this is a grandmother who has this, this, and this about her. And this one's her mum who has this and this. And I look for the differences. Okay, so mum was more outgoing. Grandmother was a bit more quiet. So right, I want the outgoing one over here. And I want the quiet grandmother over here. And then, so I'm asking them to separate themselves out. I'm asking one on this side, one on this side. Technically, they're not really on this side, me on this side. But then what I'm doing is I'm moving my energy. And I'm looking this side of me. But because I say when I'm looking this side, the rule is I want the outgoing mum. I'm therefore looking for evidence from the outgoing mum. And the outgoing mum's saying, okay, my turn. And I'm saying, no, I'm moving this side now. I want the quiet grandmother. And then the quiet grandmother goes, yeah, okay, my turn. They're not really stood there or there. They're just blending with my mind. But it's, it's, it's a system. We try to find a system that helps us sort it out. If I'm working platform and that happens, I actually physically go and move to that part of the platform and physically go and move to the other side of the platform. And again, it's not that they're there or there. It's just my own system that I've got for how I'm working with them. And it generally works. It generally works. And with practice, yeah, you can pick it. You know, sometimes with practice, I can feel too. I've got, I've got two energies coming in here. Um, but sometimes if they're very similar in their personalities or their energies, you, you know, it can be hard to separate them. If mum and grandmother, mum's mum, if they come together and they were almost identical as personalities, you know, they're both the same. They're both quiet ladies. They're both loving, quiet, easygoing, easy natured. There's very little to separate them out then. So I'm then having to, we then have to look for things that are different because just the feel of their personality or the feel of their energy is the same. So we want to separate it out. And, you know, and the first thing I'll be doing, if I sense that, hang on, it's just a double link, two communicators, I'll be seeing, can I feel a change in the different energies? And can I see the energies? I'm going to make, yeah, one's a quiet energy, one's a lively energy. I'm able to separate it out just from their energies. But yeah, it's definitely a practice thing. 
It happens. It will happen when you're a beginner more often, absolutely. And you just got to learn to work with it. And again, a lot of it is the clairsentience of feeling their energy. If you, if you haven't really developed much clairsentience, it gets harder because it can be harder to separate the different fields of energy. So yes, does that all make sense? You're with me. For more information on my videos, study program and online classes, please visit my website www.martintwycross.com.